And open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Goodbye, childrens. Have a good time in church. Mark 4. And Nick. <laughs> Mark chapter 4. I've been excited about getting the opportunity to preach this message. And honestly, this is one that I would like to preach outdoors under a tent with a crowd of the lost people. And uh, I think that it is, this is a valuable message both to the saved and to the lost. And I do not believe that there will be a single individual in this room this morning to whom the Word of God does not apply very directly this morning, and that, that gives you a great amount of confidence when you go into the pulpit knowing that God has something for everybody. And this is a passage of Scripture that includes everybody in the world, and so this is, uh, I think it'll be vital to us and very important this morning. We're going to begin reading in Mark chapter 4, and we'll read verses 1 uh, through 9 for the beginning of our text this morning. This is after Jesus has uh, warned those individuals who had blasphemed God's Holy Spirit by claiming that when he cast out devils, he did so in the name of the devil, Beelzebub. And of course, Jesus' warning to them was, you can blaspheme me, you can blaspheme God, you can blaspheme anything you like to, but you blaspheme the Holy Spirit and God won't forgive it. It's a major, major issue. And uh, I think if you want to, I've had some people ask me this last week, what do you think happened to those individuals that accused the Holy Spirit of doing the work of the devil. Well, they died. I'm certain about that. And uh, I'll be more specific about it. I think they died right away. I, I think it's probably similar to an Ananias and Sapphira kind of a situation where those individuals carried them out. Pastor, is that in the Scripture? Not exactly. The Bible doesn't include it. You know, when Jesus says something is going to happen, you don't need the Scripture to illustrate or prove it very much. But Jesus said, it won't be forgiven you. So I know this, they have since died, and they've stood before God, and God hasn't forgiven the blasphemy of, against the Holy Spirit. Let me qualify one thing that maybe I said last week, but I want to make very plain, and that is there's a difference between quenching God's Spirit and blaspheming God's Spirit. And blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God is not for a Christian. I believe the Lord will take you before you ever have the opportunity to blaspheme his Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I've known Christians that have said things before. They've made statements before, and I've shuddered, and I've, I've moved away from them. I physically, you say something that's blasphemy against God, or even taking God's name in vain and using Jesus' name in vain. A major thing. The Bible says God won't hold him guiltless. Take his name in vain. You curse around me, you'll see me take a step away from you. And I'm serious about that. No kidding. It's a big, big issue, a major deal. It's, I shudder. I I quiver at it because you, you, God won't hold you guiltless. But there's a difference between the blaspheming of God's Holy Spirit and quenching the Holy Spirit. A Christian can quench God's Holy Spirit. and But a, an unbeliever can blaspheme the Spirit of God by claiming that God's Spirit does things that He does not do or that He does not do things that He does do. And I think very specifically, I shudder. I used to, my wife has helped me with this, I used to um, watch the comedy channel on television. I would turn on uh, TBN or whatever it is and watch Benny Hinn slaying people in the spirit and that sort of thing. And we always called it the comedy channel when I was growing up because it was a big joke. I mean, it really, I mean, it, it's not real. But then later on, I realized it's not a big joke. That's blasphemy. And what they're claiming to do, they're claiming God's Holy Spirit did. And that's blasphemy. And I just don't know uh, how they're going to stand before God. I, I, I don't believe Benny Hinn's saved, if you want to know. Uh, my opinion about that. I've looked at uh, his testimony. He doesn't ever testify that Christ saved him from sin. He, he's made up so many different things that salvation is that aren't in the Bible. And I believe he'll probably burn in hell. But the spirit, the thing in sp specifically that I fear for him in judgment is blasphemy against God's Holy Spirit. And all those individuals that have and that make money off of so-called spiritual things, that's all it's about. It's about money. And it's a joke. And I'll tell you something, they can mess around with religion and they can steal from people and become charlatans and crooks all they want to, but the day that they stand before Holy God, if they blasphemed His Holy Spirit, my goodness, I just, I don't even, I don't even know what the judgment is for that. I know it. I do believe that there, that if you study the Bible that, uh, you know, people want to argue about it, but that there's different degrees in hell and that sort of thing. And 
I don't know all the specifics about it, but I think that there is there are places in hell that are different from others, and I would certainly believe that the blasphemers of the Holy Spirit go to the hottest and the fiercest, and uh, we know that's for eternity, and it's a serious matter. You can reject Jesus all you want to, and you'll go to hell for it, and you can blaspheme the Holy Spirit of God, and you'll go to hell for it. Mark chapter 4, and we'll get into today's text entirely, uh, just moving in a different uh, phase of, the, of this letter. We'll read our text this morning, and then we're going to see some application that will apply to you and to me this morning before we're through. This is about Jesus. He began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and he said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. And when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And so we'll say this morning, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Heavenly Father, help us this morning as we go to your word. Lord, we're not looking today for comfort. Today we're not looking for encouragement. God, today we're wanting to know truth. We're wanting to know where we fit in this parable of the sower. God, I ask that there would be any individual in here this morning that is looking to anything other than the simple work of the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross of Calvary for their salvation, that God this morning, they would be very honest about their, how they stand before you. And that this morning, God, that they would see their need for salvation and that they would see their need to be one of those individuals that has ears to hear and that they would receive the gospel. And Lord, I ask that if there would be any Christians here this morning that would fit in any category other than those that are fruitful, uh, that bear fruit, God, I ask that you would help us to have ears to hear. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand this matter. And God, I just pray that as we preach and we look at the characteristics of these individuals, Lord, help us not to deceive ourselves. Help us not to deny the motives of our heart and the reasons that we live and what we're doing. And God, I just ask that you would help us to see how important it is that as Christians we bring forth fruit. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Jesus told parables for a specific reason. You know, I've heard people say about a parable that a parable is a short story or an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Well, that's a good definition for a parable. It is a story that people on earth could relate to, but it's telling spiritual truths or heavenly truths. So a physical story that physically we can relate to, heavenly concepts or truths. But you know, if you study what Jesus said about parables, he says that he told parables for a different reason. Many Christians believe that Jesus told parables so that people could understand. So they would say, well, the parable was an illustration. It was a way to help people understand the truth. And I want to say to you this morning from the Scripture, that's not even so at all. It's a contradiction of what the Bible actually teaches. A parable was not written so that a person could understand it. It was meant to obscure heavenly truth from those individuals who would have tread upon it, who would have not received it. It was, it was actually used to hide truth rather than to relay truth. And a parable was not even understood many times by those individuals who wanted to receive them. Later on, Jesus had to tell what it meant. Has anyone ever told you a riddle? A parable is much like a riddle. So let me give you a riddle. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm just not very interested in things, but sometimes a riddle gets me. Somebody will tell a riddle. I, I used to uh, tell a riddle. It went like this. It would tell a story about uh, a young couple who was, uh, and I, I heard it from someone else. I didn't come up with this. You've heard it before. But tell a, a young couple who was newly married. They went to Hawaii. They were on vacation, and they're walking down the beach, 